member of our church, Chris Arnson, for, for many years. I, I had, and when I had pastored the church, he was still there till he moved to Pennsylvania. Well, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, I'm kind of doing something interesting this evening. One of the blessings about being part of a conference is you can preach a little different than you normally do, because when you preach every Sunday, you're usually, or many people go through a book, and you're working through chapter and, and, and verse, and just going through it uh, expositionally, and so you have a little more freedom to, uh, to be a little more creative at a conference. You're still going to be faithful to the text, but you can be a little more broad and, and be a little more um, committed to a general subject. And so I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 17, and when you turn there... It's going to be a very familiar text. We've all read it. We've all heard this story. We've read it in children's books. Um, we can tell it so well, but I'm actually going to be hitting something from this text in a very unique way, uh, and hopefully it will suit well this um, conference series on the grace of God. We'll be considering specifically how the grace of God uh, is manifested in Christ's act of love for us and how that ought to affect us. So we're going to look at things more from the, uh, the standpoint of how His grace ought to affect us when we consider the greatness of His grace. Uh, and we'll see here in 1 Samuel, you might be like, well, how do we get to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and David and Goliath and what's going on there? How do we get to that, uh, that end? Well, you'll see and you'll follow with me and see that. And I want you to focus especially on David's words his faith in the Lord, and then how Jonathan interacts with David after David slays the giant. Now, we're not going to read the whole text. You all know the story very well. The Philistines and the Israelites were at war. Again, they were the greatest enemies of the Israelites at this time period when King Saul was reigning. The Philistines were uh, great enemies of, of Israel. And at that time, they had, uh, they had set up for battle uh, the Israelites were on one hill with their soldiers, and the Philistines were on another hill, and in the middle was the Valley of Elah. And in the Valley of Elah, there was this challenge that was put forth by the Philistines, and specifically Goliath, that great giant of a man, uh, to come down into the, uh, into the valley and have one of the Israelites, one mighty person of the Israelites, to come down and face him, and whoever would win, then the, the, the one who would win, their camp would go against the others and would plunder their enemies. So there was this challenge by Goliath uh, to the Israelites. And of course, the Israelites were, were terrified. Uh, this man was huge. He was monstrous. His armor was so heavy that probably most people couldn't even lift uh, the, the armor that he had and the, the weapons and his armor bearer even had a shield for him, a shield bearer. And, and so he was a great and mighty warrior from his youth, we're told. Uh, and so as he challenged the Israelites time and time again, uh, time is passing and the Israelites are just afraid to send anybody in there. Nobody is, is, is bold enough to face this giant. And you know the story. David is sent by his father to provide food for the Israelites and for his brothers who were, some of his older brothers were there with Saul in, in the army and he was there to provide food for them and for the commanders and some others there and while David's there he hears this challenge again from Goliath and David is roaring, his blood is roaring because he's saying how can this man, this heathen man challenge the God of Israel? We serve the living God. He didn't think anything about the man's size, right, or his weapons or any of that. He just knew that they served the living God, and how can this man dare blaspheme our God? Let, let me go in there and fight him, right? That was his attitude, and David's only maybe uh, mid to late teens. Some people say 16, 17, 18 in that area, so he's a young man. He's, uh, he's not suited to go out to battle at this point. He's a shepherd boy, and his brothers are there, and he's just there to give food. Um, and as he's kind of ready to, to take up this, this challenge himself, uh, everybody's kind of like, whoa, well, this doesn't look like it's going to work, David. His brothers are seeing him as arrogant. But then word gets to Saul, and I want to take you from there when Saul interacts with David and just follow through to the rest of the story into when he defeats the giant. And then David actually has this conversation with Jonathan that I really want to highlight with you for this evening. So if you look with me, beginning in verse 31, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, we'll start there and continue on to verse 4 of chapter 18. 
So we're told, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." And that all this assembly may know that the Lord, Yahweh, saves, not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to, uh, to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over, to, over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath, and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharaim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And then verse 18, 1 through 4. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. Let's pray. Father, as we think about what we've just looked at, particularly the response of Jonathan to David's faith and his victory over 
Goliath and the Philistines, we do pray that you would give us a glorious glimpse of our warrior, of our Savior, our Deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us to slay the enemy so that we could plunder the enemy's camps following on the heels of the victory of Christ's cross. Lord, we ask that you would fill us with your Spirit. Meet with us. Give us a taste of this love that is better than the love of women that was between David and Jonathan. And help us to see how this portrays the love that Christ has with his church. Lord, we ask as we consider your grace today and your sending of your Son and his love for us, May it impact each and every one of us for great good so that our lives would be affected by it and that we would lay down our lives with Jonathan for the sake of Christ. Oh, Father, hear our prayers. And if there are any in here who do not know you, we ask that you would bring them to this same Savior, that they might be redeemed and saved by the one who yet slays sin through his cross. Hear our prayers, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let me just ask you for one more moment to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 1. I just want to read verses 25 to 27. This was after Jonathan and Saul, King Saul, were killed uh, in the great battle that they had with the Philistines. And David wrote a song to honor them. And I just want you to hear David's words there, especially about Jonathan, as he commemorates him and teaches Israel to sing this song just verses 25 to 7 in 2 Samuel chapter 1. Let's hear the word of our God. David says, How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. One of the most profound and awe-inspiring relationships displayed in all of the Old Testament is the relationship that existed between David and Jonathan, King Saul's son. And the circumstances surrounding this relationship considering the fact what, that King Saul was seeking to unjustly kill David and that Jonathan was really set to be next in line for the throne, at least from the standpoint of what would naturally you would expect from a king. Considering those circumstances, all the more we find that this relationship was exemplary and meant to be pondered and viewed through a new covenant lens. There was something so supernatural about this relationship that the unregenerate man cannot even process it. They can't understand this relationship. The best that the unbeliever can come up with is that David and Jonathan must have been homosexuals. They must have been gay, which is utterly absurd, but it's understandable coming from those who cannot possibly grasp the shared love that exists between Christ and His church. Three times in the book of 1 Samuel, we are told that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. And here in the text we just read in 2 Samuel chapter 1, as David mourns the death of Jonathan, he states, I'm distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Well, this evening, I want to get, to get to the very bottom and root of this love with the hope of laying hold of its profound substance and translating it into the love that exists between Christ and His church. And brethren, I hope that it penetrates our hearts with great fervor. I hope that as we ponder this, it would lead us to examine ourselves and to ensure that our love for Christ is still kindled, that it's still a fire as years and years are going by and we're nearing glory, that our love for Him is still a fire and that we've not, as the Ephesian church was starting to do in Revelation, losing our first love. And if you are not a Christian this evening, 
I hope that you might get even a taste of the elation that comes to all who have been united to Christ by faith. For until you come to see just how far your sin has driven you away from your God and Creator, and just how glorious and great a sacrifice Christ has made to reconcile sinners to Himself, you will never understand the profound joy that comes with being the object of the love of Jesus Christ. His love is life. In fact, in Psalm 63.3, we can say that His loving kindness is better than life. Well, let's look then at Jonathan's love for David for a few moments here. What was it that brought Jonathan to the point that we are told, and we saw in two different places, uh, in that one text you see it twice, and there's another place where we'll see this as well, where Jonathan says this, that he loved David as, as his own soul. What brought him to that point? Well, if we go back to the first time we're told this in the text that we read at the beginning, I believe we can discover the answer to this question. Immediately following David's defeat of Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, we find Jonathan coming to meet David in chapter 18, right? It's continuing on. But we find Jonathan coming to meet David after David had defeated Goliath. And Jonathan's actions are very telling. I want you to hear again just those few verses in chapter 18. It's only four verses. Because I want you to see as we look at some of these key facts which can help us identify the foundation upon which their strong friendship was built, I want you to see how this love begins to, uh, to come out of Jonathan. We're told again in those first four verses, now when David had finished speaking to Saul, so Saul is addressing him, he finds out who he is, he's going to take hold of him and bring him uh, to lead his armies. But we're told, interesting, right? Now when David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan, remember Jonathan had, even, had not even spoken to David yet at this point, um, where after he had killed Goliath. But the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now listen to this. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. And so as Saul speaks with David and finds out where he is from with the intention of ultimately making David the leader over his army, Jonathan is waiting with a sense of anticipation to approach David himself. He wants to speak to this young man, this young teenager. But before even speaking a word to David, we're told that his soul is already knit to David's. And so we find here the actions then of Jonathan following this, he makes this covenant with David, are tremendous evidences as he makes this covenant and what he does that affirm the great love and respect he had for David. You look at the actions, they speak volumes. Remember, Jonathan is the oldest son of the king of Israel. He is the presumed heir to the throne. And so what does Jonathan then do with David? First, he disrobes himself of his own princely robe. See, Jonathan would have had a robe that would have distinguished him from all of the other soldiers indicating that he was the king's son. He didn't just have an ordinary robe or, or an ordinary garment. In fact, they would not have had robes like everyone else. It was something that showed that this is the prince of Israel. Then, he also gives him his own armor, his own sword, his own bow, and his own belt. Now what was John, Jonathan doing by these profound gestures? What, what is he doing here? What's the point in this? He was humbling himself and honoring David as the bravest warrior worthy of the succession to the throne. In other words, 
Even now, Jonathan was indicating by his actions that David ought to be given what by human right ought to have belonged to Jonathan. Can you imagine someone doing this? Think about all throughout history of those who have ruled over nations in this world. What do you see? How do you see them treating the kingdom that they have or that they're going to come into? They fight tooth and nail, and murder countless people so as to secure the throne for themselves, don't they? They want to protect that, that throne. Go read about King Herod, and you can see what he did to protect his throne. The man was just so, uh, he, he was, everywhere he went, he, was, uh, he, he just thought that somebody was going to try to take over his throne. He killed some of his own children, and so on. Power has always been a coveted desire of mankind. Even in Israel, you can read through First and Second Kings and Chronicles and see how such heinous sins were committed as a means of securing the throne. Read about those kings again and just focus your attention on what many of these individuals did to secure the throne, to maintain the throne, to keep the throne, and even brothers, those who were, who were supposed to inherit it, what they did to kill siblings and so on. Even Athaliah, a mother of her children, killed those who were in line so that she could reign over Judah. Look at the extent that Saul himself had gone to keep David from securing the throne. David did nothing but serve Saul to the fullest, and yet Saul, being jealous of him, wanted and sought to kill him. And even amongst David's own sons, for that matter, we see that kind of contention, don't we? What Absalom does to David. And later on, what happens with David's sons later on after David is getting ready to leave this earth? Uh, what takes place in trying to usurp Solomon from the throne? And yet, Jonathan turns all of his dignity over to David. And brethren, we have to see that this is absolutely unnatural. It's not natural. It's unheard of to the natural man. Because to do this, you would have to take away from yourself, you would have to humble yourself and strip yourself of all of the glory that can easily come your way. Think of what Jonathan would have anticipated to be king, the respect, the honor, the power, the wealth. Only to hand it over to another. And in this case, a teenager... A rosy-cheeked, ruddy, uh, ru ru ruddy, ruddy teenager. Now the question that is begged is this. What is it that compelled Jonathan to do this? Why is there this repeated statement given in the text saying that Jonathan loved David as his own soul, which is affirmed by his actions? We can see that clearly defined. He literally loved David as his own soul. And we'll see that in some of the other texts we're going to look at. Well, I want you to consider closely what David had just done. You see, it's not simply the case that David was braver than every single soul that existed in the Israelite army. That's true, and certainly Jonathan had great respect for David because of that. But I want you to see two other things, two other realities that pop out of the events surrounding David's slaying of the giant that led Jonathan to knit his heart, his soul to David's, and even to humble himself and to exalt David in a position that rightly belonged to Jonathan. First, here's the first thing. In defeating the giant, David delivered Israel from the oppression and rule of the Philistines. For a long time now, Goliath had been put forth as the Philistine champion, challenging any Israelite to come and face him. And whoever would win that battle, it would lead to the utter defeat and submission of their enemies. The Philistines were Israel's, Israel's greatest enemies at this time. But not a single Israelite was willing to step up to fight Goliath. Now think about that for a moment. Jonathan himself was a brave warrior. Jonathan had took it upon himself, he and his, 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 his armor bearer, 
to go and to take hold of a Philistine, a Philistine garrison without anyone knowing. And in the process of that, he killed 20 men, or he, he, he cut them down, and his armor bearer would go up and just make sure the deal was done along the way. He killed all these men, and there was fear. He took over a garrison on his own. This was no man who was timid or afraid or fearful. He was a bold man, Jonathan. And in fact, his words in that text, you see, when Jonathan speaks to his, uh, his armor bearer, he says, look, it's in the power of God's hand to, to take and, and win a battle with one man or with many. He could do with one. In other words, his faith was in God. Jonathan was a man of faith. He took great risks. But even he was not willing to step out on this occasion to face Goliath. The tall, handsome broad-shouldered King Saul, who was above height from everyone else, was unwilling to step out and face the giant. And so Israel was on the verge of utter defeat and collapse without hope, as it were, as no one would face the giant and time was running out. They were in a hopeless situation where the, the nation could very well have been annihilated. But David... This short teenager who was too small and frail to put Saul's armor on. He steps forward with nothing but a sling and a few stones and boldly slays the giant. David was, and keep these words in mind because you know where we're going with this. David was the great deliverer of God's people when they had no hope. David had conquered the greatest foe of the Israelites, rescuing them from certain death and perpetual slavery. David was their deliverer, and when he delivered, the Israelites went in and plundered after he delivered. But secondly, I believe there's a second reason why Jonathan had had this kind of respect and love for David. David exhibited a tremendous faith in his God, and this deeply impressed Jonathan. This is especially seen when David spoke to Saul before the fight and told him that when Saul said, you can't possibly win. This guy's been a warrior from his youth and you're just a youth. And David spoke about God delivering the bear uh, into his hands, right? And how he had saved his father's sheep from lions and bears and, and that God would be the one that would deliver him into his hands. But also, it's what David said during the battle that impressed Jonathan as well. And we saw that in the words that he spoke as this giant came out with all of the armor, all of this heavy equipment and javelin and spear and, and shield and, and weighted armor and, uh, from, from head to toe. And David said, you come to me with all these things and javelin and spear and I come to you in the name of Yahweh and he will give me your head this day. And so I believe it is the fact that David had delivered the Israelites from out of the hands of the Philistines along with the great faith that David had in his God when doing so, which greatly impressed Jonathan, leading him to love David as his own soul. And the irony in this is that a short time after this, Saul comes what to hate and to grow jealous of David leading him to move in the very opposite direction of his son, Jonathan. You want to talk about pressure? as he seeks to kill David rather than give him his due honor. And the whole time, even at the very risk of his own life, Jonathan does all that he can against his own father to defend and protect David. That was the great love that he had for him. I want to read a couple of texts with you to show you how Jonathan had stood up even to his own father, who was fighting for the cause of Jonathan as well for that matter and what Jonathan had done to defend David. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 19. You think about the influence that a father has on his children. D Jonathan was impressed. He was, he was in love with David as a, as a man of God. He had a deep concern and love for him. But even his own father could not penetrate that love that he had for David. 1 Samuel chapter 19, look at verses 1 through 7. This is the time when Saul wants to kill David. And notice how Jonathan quells his father's anger and stands up for David when he could easily say, hey, if David's gone, then I get the throne. Look at verses 1 through 7. 
And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, right, not all the servants, not anybody else, but Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself, and I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David. And Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was in his presence as before. Jonathan brought peace and reconciliation. He corrected his own father. And he was able to bring restoration there. But then you find again, when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 20, that David goes out to battle. And it's interesting because Saul sends him out to battle. And the more victorious David is, the more jealous Saul becomes. And he wants to kill him. David's doing his best to defend Israel, to do what the king wants. And the more better he does, the more he wants to, uh, the king wants to kill him. And so he finds out again. David finds out that, that, that Saul wants to kill him. In fact, Saul sends servants to David's house. Remember, he was married to Michal, Saul's, Saul's daughter. And Michal winds up, uh, winds up getting, getting David out through a window, lets him out through a window, and tries to cover for David so that he can get away, and he flees. And Saul wants to kill him. And, and then Jonathan goes to David, and David is trying to explain to him, look, your dad wants to kill me. And Jonathan says, well, he hasn't told me anything. He always tells me. And then David goes on to explain, um, well, maybe because he knows that you actually care about me. I want, you to I want to read some of that with you in 1 Samuel 20, because it's one of those... Uh, one of the most detailed interactions between Jonathan and David. And I want you to see the extent that he goes to defend David, even to the place where his own life is threatened by his father. Look at verse, uh, beginning of verse 1 in chapter 20. Then David fled from Nioth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It is not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know, uh, know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at table with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field till the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked, Leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the clan. If he says, Good, it will be well with your servant. But if he is angry, then know that harm is determined by him. Therefore deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? And Jonathan said, Far be it from you. If I knew that it was determined by my father that harm should come to you, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me if your father answers you roughly? And Jonathan said to David, Come, let us go out into the field. So they both went out into the field. And Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow, or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also, if I do not disclose it to you, and send you away, that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive... Show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. 
Then Jonathan said to him, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed, because your seat will be empty. On the third day, go down quickly to the place where you hid yourself when the matter was in hand, and remain beside the stone heap. And I will shoot three hours to the side of it, as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send the boy, saying, Go, find the arrows. If I say to the boy, Look, the arrows are on this side of you, take them, then you are to come, for as the Lord lives, it is safe for you, and there is no danger." But if I say to the youth, look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The king sat on his seat as at other times on the seat by the wall. Jonathan sat opposite, and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Yet Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something has happened to him. He's not clean. Surely he is not clean. But on the second day, the day after the new moon, David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, Let me go, for our clan holds a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. So now, if I have found favor in your eyes, let me go away and see my brothers. For this reason he has not come to the king's table. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. In the morning, Jonathan went out into the field to the appointment with David and with him a little boy, and he said to his boy, Run and find the arrows that I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow behind him. And when the boy came to the place of the arrow that Jonathan had shot, Jonathan called after the boy and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan called after the boy, Hurry, be quick, do not stay. So Jonathan's boy gathered up the arrows and came to his master, but the boy knew nothing. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter, and Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and said to him, go and carry them to the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times, and they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between, be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Just one more short text, 1 Samuel 23. I want you to get all these texts in mind of Jonathan's dealings, even with his own father, and protecting David to the extent where his own life was even threatened. 1 Samuel 23, verses 14 through 18, just these few verses here. David remained in the strongholds. This is when David is hiding out still from Saul. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. David saw that Saul, came, that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. Jonathan, David's uh, Saul's son, goes and strengthens David's hand as he's discouraged and he's despairing because of what Saul is doing. Saul's son does this. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I will be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horish, and Jonathan went home. And so all in all, brethren, we find Jonathan serving to defend, protect, encourage, and strengthen David throughout the entire time that his father was unjustly pursuing him. This is his father, the king. Neither the entire glory of the kingdom nor the pressures of his own father, the king, were able to rend Jonathan's heart from David's. There was a supernatural bond 
which kept them together and which no man could break. And then, of course, in the song that David had written following the death of Jonathan, we find those profound and precious words where David describes Jonathan as one who was a brother to him, as one whose love was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. What a profound statement to to define Jonathan and his relationship to David. What greater love could there ever be in this life than a love that exists between a man and his own wife? Where can one find a greater measure of intimacy and a deeper sense of love than that which exists in the glorious union of a man and a woman in holy matrimony? Well, we see it here. We see a greater love here. And I want to suggest to you, brethren, that this kind of relationship is meant to reflect a very real love that exists which the world cannot possibly understand, the love that exists between Christ and His church. This is where we're going. David and Jonathan were not gay. Saying such a thing grossly distorts the very glory of all that is portrayed here. A gay love is an ungodly love. It's an unnatural distortion of God's design for male and female creatures. Never for a moment to be compared to what we have seen in these precious texts. This is a divinely instilled love that goes beyond even the intimate love that exists between a man and a woman, as precious as such love can and ought to be. The intimacy between a man and a woman is one of the greatest loves that can exist on this earth. But there is a greater love than that. And I want us to consider now what we've gone over then from a new covenant vantage point as we behold the love that exists between Christ and His church as reflected in the love that existed between Jonathan and David. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. <coughs> I just want to read Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21 with you. This is kind of that middle of the book uh, that connects the indicatives, right? The first three chapters of Ephesians are, uh, are, there's no commands. It's all just a glory of what God has done for us before time, in time, brought us into His church, His love for the church. It's, it's what God has done for us, and it should set us on fire. And as Paul gets to the end of chapter 3, he prays that as we think about that, we would comprehend this love of Christ, and that would set a fire in us. It would lead us um, to act in a way of obedience, so that when we get to the next three chapters we find the commands that are given to us not to be burdensome but we're motivated to keep them because we're motivated by grace notice verses 14 to 21 in Ephesians 3 this middle of the road here this is what bridges the first three to the last three chapters here in Ephesians 3 <clears throat> look at Paul's prayer he says for this reason I bow my knees before the father from whom every family and are, uh, uh, in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to what? We're getting this build up here. Strength to what? To comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. In Ephesians 3, the Apostle Paul prays for the Ephesians that they might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, all the dimensions to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now what is Paul implying by this portion of his prayer? He is firmly stating that the love of Christ and especially His love for us 
is something that is beyond the understanding, reaching dimensions that are so large, so deep, so wide, that we could never exhaust its reach in any single direction. It is that which is at the very root and foundation of all that he's just revealed in the first three chapters of Ephesians. I wish we had time, but we don't, to read through these chapters. Although uh, Brother Tom did say he had to 11 p.m., so maybe, I'm just kidding, Uh, right? But you know those first three chapters concerning the glorious working of God in the unfolding of his glorious plan of redemption of which you and I are part, no thanks to anything that we ourselves have done to enter into it. It's all God's work. The first three chapters, all God's work and what He's done for us. Before time, planned, exercised in time, and then He applies it to us by calling us by the Spirit. All of it is His work. You see, brethren, we are the objects of so great a love A supernatural and divine love. And this love is so great that we are called to spend our entire lives delving deeper and deeper into it. you got these folks out there who are going to spend their entire lives reading the works of Thomas Aquinas and all these great allegedly theologians and all this and studying things about the essence of God that we can't even begin to comprehend and is taking us into philosophy. Throw that away. And get into delving deeper and deeper into the gospel love of Christ. You can't exhaust that. And Paul has an end in mind when he prays in this way. He knows that as we do that, as we meditate upon the grace of Christ's love for us more and more, he knows that that's going to produce something in us. He knows that that kind of a journey will lead to being filled, he says, with the fullness of God enabling us to obey every vital command given in chapters 4 through 6 of Ephesians. How do we have strength to obey? Well, we can study all kinds of deep, you know, deep theology and get into philosophy and, and bury our heads in that. No. Spend time contemplating, praying over the love of Christ in all of its dimensions. That's where the power comes from. And what does that entail? Namely, that the love of Christ actually serves to empower His people to do anything and everything, even unto the expense of their own lives, to return that love by serving Him and His glorious purposes in the building of His church. You want to see this church prosper in Franklin? Do I want to see the church prosper up in White House and all of the churches that some who were ever church you're part of? Delve into the love of Christ in your private devotional life. Mull it over. Pray through that love. And He will fire you up onto the laying down of your lives. Because brethren, Christ's love in itself is powerful. The Spirit of God, actually we're told in this text in Ephesians, has to empower us just to grasp greater depths of that love so that we will drink from its fountain and by that means give our lives wholly over to the service of Christ. We can't even delve into, that, into those dimensions without the Spirit's work. We must be strengthened, notice, with might through His Spirit in the inner man unto this end. Now what in the world does this have to do with Jonathan and David? I want you to come back from here for a moment in your minds. As we consider the acts of David, which triggered Jonathan's love for him. Look at what Jonathan had done. Look at the way he gave up everything for David. How can that even be possible? You see, David's actions changed Jonathan on that occasion. When David slew Goliath, it led Jonathan to empty himself of all self-worth and glory and to hand over all that was his by natural right to David. Jonathan didn't plan that. He didn't think that was going to happen, but when he witnessed what David had done for the people of God and his faith in God, Jonathan emptied himself. Jonathan was compelled unto an action that would have been unheard of before. Whatever he was... 
Whatever Jonathan thought he was no longer meant anything to him. He turned it all over to David, acknowledging him as the rightful heir to Israel's throne. David's great faith in God and his willingness to deliver the people of God who were desperate and were about to be annihilated as one who by all rights, he wasn't even responsible to do that. David was a shepherd boy. He was there to bring food to the soldiers. And yet, his actions, his faithfulness, greatly impacted and changed Jonathan's life forever. And brethren, is this not reflective of that which has happened to us when by grace... We were brought into the church of the redeemed through the deliverance that we were given in Christ. A deliverance far greater than what David had done. David had brought about a physical deliverance. We have a far greater giant who was conquered for us. Our lives were radically changed by what Christ has done. We were born again. We came to the end of ourselves. The old man died and a new man arose with Christ. And something so profound has taken place which only increases and grows stronger and stronger the longer we walk with Christ. Everything that once meant anything to us, all of the glory that we sought for ourselves in this life, all of the sins that we entrenched ourselves in, every lust, that had our heart. Every pearl that we had stored up in this world, we had willingly delivered over to the feet of Christ when He conquered our sin. We became servants of this blessed Savior and we delighted in doing so. We handed over our own robes, as it were, our own wills, our own desires, our own armor, our own weaponry. We gladly handed it all over and embraced the will of Christ as our own. And our soul was knit to His. We became, and are incre increasingly becoming, consumed with His glory. Our eyes have been opened to the wonders of His profound love for us. And the power of that profound love toward us has changed us. What has changed you and me, brethren? What has made you and I what we are today? Not what we will be, but what we are right now for the moment. Heading toward glory. What has changed us from what we were to what we are is nothing less than the love of Christ. It has made us lovers of Christ and of God. As the psalmist stated, his loving kindness became better than life to us. And as we've been periodically taken to witness the utter natural corruption of our own hearts and souls, terrified of the reality of what we are by nature, only to look up and see the welcoming, loving arms of Christ ever around us, we've been overwhelmed and consumed by a love that surpasses the love of women. We have seen the unflinching, unwavering, unchanging love of God directed toward us, in spite of us, in the light of His holy nature, laying hold of us fully, perfectly, and completely, and we were blown away to see that our eternal God and Creator actually loves us in this way. And when we try to make sense of it, we can't. We can't. We only know that it is real and true and sincere. And there are times when we've doubted it. There are times when we perhaps thought that maybe this isn't real. Maybe God's going to suddenly turn on us. Especially as we fall short. But He's done no nothing but continually loved and preserved us. And most of all, we have the cross to prove it. Yes, the Goliath of our sin, which has left the people of God without hope. He was conquered and thrust down, beheaded and utterly defeated, not by a wooden sling and a stone, but by a wooden cross and three nails. When we were without hope, when we were without love for God and only full of hate, when we were without strength, nothing in us to help us, Christ died for us. 
thanks be unto God that he died for the ungodly. Amen. And he revealed himself to us and he took our hearts captive. And now our hearts are knit to his and the more we know him, the more we travel down the paths that take us through the dimensions of his love, the more we love him as Jonathan loved David, even more than father or mother or brother or sister or son or daughter or wife or husband or self. And when we consider his unwavering and faithful commitment to the Father, his love for the Father, when we see his own faith, which led him to welcome the incarnation, which led him to a full obedient life to God as a man, full of all the, the horror and surrounding, uh, uh, surroundings of his suffering in the cross that he faced, when he, we look beyond this earthly veil and get a profound glimpse of divine intertrinitarian love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, eternally rooted in a God who is love, it brings everything that we value in this world into a proper perspective, and we are willing to lay it down. And lay, all that we have, we're willing to lay it down at His feet. God becomes our all, and we're willing to let go of everything just to know, love, and serve him. Well, brethren, let me leave you with this final exhortation. This is going to close here. You are where you are today. You are here among the people of God on a Friday night when most are probably out at bars, are watching TV, are doing all kinds of other things. You are among the people of God, delighting in God and offering Him praise. You are bound for heaven where you will experience a joy like none other, completely and entirely by the grace of God. And because He set His love upon you from before the foundation of the world. Our lives belong to Him now. And isn't that a wonderful joy? Isn't that our privilege that's a privilege we have. It's an honor to love and serve and adore Christ. God has created and designed us for His glory. And He has redeemed us from the curse of our sin, which has separated us from Him. Brethren, we exist in a time and space that exists all by and for God. We are living creatures because God decided to give us life. And his son took on flesh and entered and became part of this creation for the purpose of redeeming us and bringing us to God. That is life itself. To know God and his son Jesus Christ is eternal life. He stepped into the valley of Elah to battle our sin and to defeat it and to cut its head off by his own suffering and death. Let me ask you, what are we unwilling to shed for his glory. What are we unwilling to shed? Are we not willing to give up our robes and our pride and our armor and our weapons and everything that is ours by way of glory or right? If I can appeal to you with even one great plea, it is this. Live for him, brethren. Live for him who died for you and fight every day to get even a little taste of his amazing and profound love for you. And some of you folks here who might be in an upper age, I'm starting to get upper age, but some of you are even more of an upper age. You are not done. You have a purpose still, and you could bring glory to Christ for the remaining time that he gives you here. Don't retire and go down to Florida and get in your golf cart. Serve God with the breath that you have because the day is coming, the night is coming when there'll be no more work to do. This is the only time you have to glorify Him in a world that is lost and fallen. Don't ever think for a moment that because you're in your 60s, your 70s, your 80s, your 90s, whatever it is, that you need to retire from the faith, and not, not the faith, but from being involved in any sense and bringing glory to Christ. God does so much more by the gray hair than you can ever realize. Serve Him until your dying breath. Give Him glory, and you will never regret it. 
If you're not in Christ this morning, oh, that you could only see the glory of what you were missing. It may seem so corny and small to you. I know it did to me before God opened my eyes. But there is no more wondrous delight. There is no greater joy than to experience the love of Christ, which passes even the love of women. The love of Christ far, far exceeds any temporal joy that you may get out of the things that are molded from this earth. And I wish everything in this, everyone in this entire room would experience the reality of God's special relational love for even a moment, if you haven't. For then you would go and sell all that you have to lay hold of that pearl of great price. Your sin blinds you. Your sin is what presently separates you from relating to the living God. But God has done something about that. He has sent His Son to die for sinners. His wrath has been appeased. Your sin can be removed forever. But you must come to Him. Cry out to Him. Speak to Him. Believe into the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And you will never, ever, ever regret it. May God give us the grace. We are His people to never grow tired of meditating on His love for us. And may God give grace to those who do not know that love yet for you to come to see that Christ is willing this day to pardon all of your sins and to reconcile you to the Father. Let's pray. Father, we give You thanks for your amazing grace. Lord, we know that a conference like this, we can touch on but a minute fraction of what your grace really means. So many different ways we can consider your grace. Everything that you've done, even in creation itself, is grace. And yet we pray that in some way, that as we've had this opportunity to speak to your people, that you would use what has been presented in great ways and that you would move in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, Father, to drink more and more from an understanding of the love of Christ. There is no one in this room, no matter how long they've been a Christian, that can say that they have plateaued in understanding the love of Christ. It is so much deeper, so much wider, so much broader, so much higher. Oh, Lord, we ask that you would give us fresh glimpses, and even as we witnessed this, uh, this unnatural love between David and Jonathan, we pray that we would see that in the relationship that we have with Christ, and that it would lead us to give all that we have, all that we are, to see his glory proclaimed throughout the face of this earth. And Lord, we ask for those who do not know you here this evening, please, Father, work in their hearts open up their understanding to the truths, help them to see that you are God, that you are the creator, and they must have dealings with you, and that their sin is what separates them from you. And we pray that you would lead them to the cleft of the rock, and that they would be saved from your wrath in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.